so this is a get it back. Um, uh, we want to talk about different uh, techniques and, and, and uh, um, ways to properly back up your Postgres database. Um, so why would you want to listen to me? I am, my name is Josh Williams. I work for a, a company called Endpoint Corporation. We are a, uh, primarily a, uh, like an e-commerce consultancy. We do a, a mishmash of things around that, including database consulting. And as a result, I do a mishmash of, uh, of development and ops and things like that there. Uh, one of the Postgres uh, engineers there, um, here with a couple of my uh, coworkers that decided to stop by and uh, promised to heckle me a little bit, so I <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Prime heckling real estate right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 front row seats. So, so yeah, and I've been, I've been working with uh, Postgres for <laughs> years. Um, it, it all blends together, so. Uh, um, I can't write quite claim that I've worked. I've been working with it for like 18 years, like my, like the previous talk. But uh, it's up there, um, and I guess you don't really have to listen to me. Uh, uh, take down what you see here and, and do some research yourself. Figure out what works for your environment. Um, but yeah, so how do we back up Postgres? Well, the naive way would be to write a little loop that just does a copy, <laughs> sleep for an hour, and do it again. But this isn't going to work, right? I mean, obviously, it, this is a, a shell script, so we do need that do there for the while loop. But in addition to that, I mean, just copying the, the database files is going to be uh, uh, is going to be a little bit uh, uh, tricky. And why is that? Well, it turns out Postgres is a little bit of a of a complex beast. Um, this is kind of a, a diagram of what your database might look like a, a database uh, in flight. So you've got your tables on disk. Um, and you've got uh, Postgres allocates this big chunk of memory called the shared buffer. So if you've done any tuning with, with Postgres, it's probably the, the, the parameter you've, uh, you're most familiar with uh, changing. But what actually, what is that actually? Well, when you need to access a little bit of data in Postgres, you need to uh, get something out of the database, out of those tables, or make a change to it, it actually will fetch those uh, eight kilobyte pages from, the, from your tables on disk puts it into those buffers and RAM, and then modifies it there. And so when that modification happens, it just stays there. That does not actually make it back down to the database tables right away. Mm -hmm. uh, that's done for performance reasons. Um, if, uh, if like the, the textbook example, probably the inserts that are happening at the very end of a table. If you're doing a bunch of those, you make the, it does all those modifications, all those multiple inserts in that same block built in there and later on uh, uh, pushes those down to disk. Now, the more you learn about the, this type of database technology, is, it, it starts to feel a little bit uh, uh, tenuous, a little bit fragile. So, uh, I mean, this stuff is, is sitting in RAM, changes there have happened, it's you've, you've committed them, and it, you, it's returned and says, okay, I've got the data, but, and, and, but yet it hasn't actually made it back into disk. So why is that safe? Well, as it turns out, when you make these changes uh, in the, in, into the database, uh, it, it first puts them into the, what's called the right-hand log. It's basically your transaction log. Um, so yeah, that, anything that you've made, cha any changes you've made are, is written there first. Um, and the guarantee is that it's, it's actually there. And this is done sequentially. Again, this is for performance reasons. Uh, back in the day, you know, before everything was, uh, was uh, on uh, flash SSDs and such, um, you could actually put that on a separate set of spindles that are really high performance spindles. And because it's, it's sequential, uh, um, that right position is you know, it, it's pretty much fixed. Mm -hmm. Whereas I mean, all, the, all your tables are if that's on separate disks. Those, those right heads can move all over the place and take all the time they need, um, and it, it stays pretty uh, pretty responsive. So what happens when you know it, at some point your database may crash or you lose power or something like that? All that stuff that has been written into those uh, uh, shared buffers in, uh, um, is is uh, marked as dirty. Um, how do we get this back in the disk? Well, at some point you know. If, if that database crashes and you bring it back up, it goes into recovery mode and takes those things that have been written into the right-hand log and then at that point puts it in the disk. 
So it's still, it's, it's, it's safe, but performant. So let's take this one step further. We're making these changes in disk, we're writing them to our, our, our write-ahead log or transaction log. What if in, at that point we then take a copy of those and send those off to a different server somewhere else? Who is then going through the same uh, recovery process, uh, taking those, those transaction log changes, pushing them to its own uh, uh, set of uh, uh, database tables. Uh, we've kind of uh, invented something we call replication. So there's a few types of replication. Um, there we, uh, we just kind of described, described the, uh, uh, the basis of what we call streaming replication. Uh, uh, in very recent versions, uh, there's been a sort of a logical type of replication. Uh, there's been trigger-based replication that's been existing for a little while. But this talk, I've only been allocated about four hours to this. Wait. No, I only have about 45 minutes, so I definitely, don't, I definitely don't have time to go through all the different replication options. But luckily, tomorrow, there's a talk called Your Herd of Elephants, uh, noon 30. Uh, uh, the description promises to go through all, actually, someone else is doing it, but uh, someone's going to go through all those different options. So tune in tomorrow. Um, but I did want to come back to this concept. We're taking. For that, for that type of replication, we take all the changes that are made, that are coming out of the, into the transaction log, sending them off as the wall stream over to another server, and they're being applied there. But what are they being applied to? We need some type of starting point. Otherwise, you know, the changes don't really make any sense. So we call that starting point the, the base backup. So this is your uh, physical backup of the, of the database systems. So how do we get that? Well, I, I kind of lied. You can do a, a copy of, of the whole database, um, but you need to, we need to do some preparation first. We need to make some settings changes. We need to tell Postgres that we're going to do this. So uh, it's possible, but there's a few things we need to do first. So here's what we need to do. To do the base backup, we need to make a couple changes. I think the wall level is nowadays it's set to replica as a default. It, it used to be a little bit you used to have to go ahead and set that yourself. Uh, we need to turn on what's called an archive mode, and we need to set a, uh, an archive command. And we'll get into that, uh, what that means a little bit later. Uh, so once we set those few things, um, we, we uh, uh, tell it that we're gonna do it, we do it, and then we tell it we're done. So what happens when we, uh, when we do those things? We issue this command, pg start backup. Uh, the, the database sets this uh, uh, start marker on the, uh, in it's, it's, it's a system, it makes a little mark in the, uh, in the uh, right hand logs and puts a little file up there and then does a checkpoint. Well, what's a checkpoint? So back here when I said that the, there's this big shared buffers area in memory, um, we have these dirty uh, uh, sections of memory that are written. So what the checkpoint does, is it starts at the beginning and just basically scans through and as it hits uh, something that's uh, been changed and it's marked as dirty, pushes those down into the database tables. So it goes through and does that for each one of those changes. And while this happens, um, you know, this, could be, this could be pretty much instantaneous or it could take a few minutes depending on how much RAM you have set aside for that and how many changes you've made. But the key is that this does, you, you are not allowed to start that backup process, start those copies until it returns and says, okay, that all my stuff that I have had in RAM has been written out. So once that returns, then you're able to start that start the, uh, uh, the copy of those files at your leisure. Um, and you can use whatever mechanism you want for that. You could you know, do a, a local copy, you could do an rsync to another system, anything like that. And the key is, uh, you can take as much time as you want to do this, and at no point do you ever start taking right traffic. This is all online. And the way that works is back on that, the archive command. This is any changes that are happening are going into the transaction log and that's being copied into an archive. So once that copy's done, we do a PG stop backup, which also itself waits for the archive, that last archive of that last transaction log complete, then we clean up. So, 
we have, at that point, we have like this copy of uh, all the database files and some, each one in some state uh, uh, during that, during that uh, uh, backup process. And we, they could have been writing the changes to those files even as we copy them. But that, that transaction log archive is what's the key. It knows when that backup stop has started, it knows when it stopped. So it, it can, when we do the recovery, when we restore that base backup file, uh, a set of files, then it goes through at the very, it starts at the, uh, that known start point in the transaction logs and applies everything that has been changed. So it could be rewriting things that uh, uh, it already on disk. It could be writing new stuff. It doesn't really matter too much. Um, we just know that when uh, when it's done with this process, that, that everything is brought up to a level of consistency, and that's where the magic is. So now that I've told you all that stuff about how that works, <laughs> there's this nice little uh, convenient command called PG Base Backup, which uh, actually uses the, the replication protocol, so there's a few, there might be a few uh, user level uh, uh, permission things you would want us to change, but you, this can actually run remotely and, and grab uh, the base backup from a remote system, so you don't even have to have file level access. Um, there's a few things that, I mean, that when you run this every single time, you'll get the full database on copy, which, you know, if you've got multiple terabytes of database, it's quite a bit. Um, what you, the reason I showed you, showed you that other version is you can do other things like rsync. So if you have a, if you're not, if not much of your database is changing, then you just you know, do this PG start backup and do the rsync, pull out only the little bits of, bit of the tables that have changed, and then, then you're done. So that was a lot of work to go through for what just, you know, it's, it's a, a, a single snapshot of backup. Uh, can we do more than that? Well, as you're imagining, might probably imagining at this point we can. Let's go back to this um, concept of our, our replication. You know, we've got our uh, transaction log screen that we're sending off to somewhere else, uh, uh, some other system that's consuming them. But what if instead of sending them to some other system that's, that's consuming them, we send them off to an, an archive? So what we're gathering is basically a long list of every single change that's happening to this uh, database system. So, you know, depending on what your transaction log rate, I could add them pretty quickly, but the, the concept is to um, uh, keep everything. So what can we do with that? Well, when we go through that recovery process, like we did before, it would just recover uh, as much as it needed to, to bring the database to a global consistency. But then we can, as if we have more transaction log history, and we can continue to apply them as much as we have. So that gets us to a, a point where we have <coughs> a point in time recovery. So we could, in theory, tell the database, we know, you know some, something dramatic happened that uh, today at 14.15 uh, o'clock exactly on the button, someone dropped a table or uh, deleted a, a, a valuable record or something like that. We could actually take the system back, do a restore a base backup, take the system back to this point in time and let it roll through the transaction logs until it hits that and stop and then bring up the database back up right there. Um, uh, it may be worth noting that uh, this is uh, this is only a forward, this is a forward only operation. There, we can't take transaction logs and go backwards. So if we find that you know, 14, 15, well, it was a couple seconds too late We'll have to go through this process of restoring the base backup again, and then go through a little bit, uh, pull the, the time stand back a little bit. Unfortunately, we can't just say use the transaction logs to roll it back. It'd be nice, but we can't. So now that I've told you all that, there are some projects out there that basically go through all this configuration for you. Um, they all do. They do pretty much the same thing only with different uh, uh, features and different methods for doing it. Um, I've used PG Backrest and PG Horde most recently. Um, but they all do uh, do these things a little bit differently. Um, some of them do cloud storage integration. Some of them, you know, some of them will talk to Azure or, or uh, any Swift uh, um, 
any Swift providers, some of them are S3s, some of them do encryption, some don't. Some have maybe like a, a web-based management interface, some of them are command line only, some of them just kind of throw out there and let them do its thing, and, and uh, you don't even have to, have to manage them that much. So um, look for, just if, you, if you're looking for this type of thing, I would say uh, try out a couple. It doesn't really, I mean, most of these are free, so it doesn't hurt to run a couple in parallel and see, what, uh, see how they work for you. Uh, I had a couple challenges with PG Horde, and that's why I switched to PG Backrest, but um, they're, they're be definitely both good products, uh, projects, and I'm sure the rest of them are too. So, I'm going through this really quickly. That's fine. Uh, so, we'll, we'll also talk about uh, PG Dump a little bit. Um, this is, when you think of backups, this is probably what you're most familiar with anyway. Um, PG Dump is a, a tool that generates a series of uh, SQL statements that uh, um, will be able to restore your database to that, that particular snapshot. So it, it connects in, looks at your table definitions, looks at your indexes, looks at your constraints, um, and is able to figure out what, you know, the, the commands that uh, are needed to rebuild that and includes the, the, the data itself. So, like I said, this, is, this sometimes feels a little bit uh, fragile, but this is pretty well tested. I mean, does it, does it get everything? At, uh, does, are we sure that it gets everything? And yeah, it's, it's pretty well tested technology. Um, so the advantages of this methodology is that uh, it works over your normal Postgres type of connection, you know, the type of thing that your application would use to connect to the database. Whereas you know, the PG-based backup, it, was, it needed a special replication connection in a few settings. Um, this, doesn't, this doesn't really need any special settings, no configuration changes to your PostgreSQL.conf uh, needed. Uh, if you're writing a, a script that does you know, your daily backups or something like that, you're probably running it directly on the database server itself, uh, usually with the like, Postgres super user permissions. But if you don't have that, like if you're running on uh, um, like a Heroku database or something that you, they only give you that user level, uh, that, that unprivileged user level connection, you can still use pgjump to connect to the database, read what read, read that the user has access to, and, and pull the data. Um, the base backup, uh, if I didn't mention it, I don't think I did. it's, you get the entire database cluster or nothing, basically. Um, if you have multiple databases, if you, if, uh, you have uh, a number of things happening there, that base backup is everything. PG dump, on the other hand, is, is very selective. It's uh, by default, not even by default, necessarily uh, each individual database uh, and you can be more selective than that. You can ask it for individual tables. You can ask it for your, the schema only, which is basically your table definitions. You can ask it for the data only. So uh, you can be, it's, it's pretty flexible. And maybe most importantly, the output of that is text. Now, who can guess what the, the most important, you know, the, the reason that that's a good thing? Uh, you can actually see what your database is doing. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 it's kind of a, I, I labeled that one as being kind of future-proof. Um, uh, you know, occasionally I'll uh, uh, pull in a backup of something that, you know, from, from like 20 years ago and load up the files. It's like, wait a minute, what is this uh, kind of opaque blob? It's a base backup. Well, the, the SQL is text, so you can definitely, you know, you know exactly what that is. Uh, one of the big, uh, uh, one of the big problems with Postgres is that the upgrades are very difficult. Um, you, there are ways to do, uh, sort of ways to do in-place upgrades, but this used to be the only way that you could get a, uh, 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 your data from one version to another, because you would do an export to the SQL statements and uh, reapply them to a, a newer version. Uh, what are my notes to say as far as other reasons? Uh, it gets very comp compressible. Uh, base backups, um, it's, it's your, your binary format, uh, uh, and, and that includes indexes and uh, other things that you may not really, really care to store. 
the, the, the PD dump, that's, that's purely your data. So, uh, uh, honorable mention, there's a little sister command called PD dump all. Uh, it basically is sort of like the base backup where it gets everything, but uh, it, it's essentially, um, the way I do it is I just ask for the globals, the PG all dash globals, and that gets the, basically gets your users, uh, permission, some permissions on users, all the stuff that doesn't, nece doesn't necessarily apply to a single database. So then I'll do a loop through all the databases I have in a cluster and run PG dump on those individuals, just so I get them in, in separate files, so they're, they're a little bit more manageable. But you can, you can run PG dump all and just get everything from your database. So there are a couple downsides to doing that technique though. There's no way, this, your PG dump really is just a snapshot of your database at that point in time. There's no way to apply transaction logs or anything to bring that uh, to a, a further state that, it, that you might have, which actually that may not be true because uh, Postgres now has a, a logical decoding of its transaction logs. So you might be able to figure out some way of doing that, but there's no real um, uh, secure way of doing it, no guaranteed way. Um, it's a little harder to optimize the performance of that because, again, you're doing, it, it's looking at every single table in that database and doing a sequential scan of it to get all the data out. So, and there's also a blocking now and doing all this process. There is a little bit of a lock on it, so you're, you're, uh, so you're prevented from making, um, I think you're prevented from making uh, a schema level changes or uh, uh, anything, anything, anything that takes a, an exclusive lock. But it won't lock you from reading, it won't lock you from writing. Coming um, from my SQL on Yes. <laughs> That's no, no, yeah, cool. it's, it's, it, you're, it, this, again, this is also all online, so. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess one of the interesting things about the base backups is that while you, while that was running, you were still allowed to create tables, delete tables, anything you want to do in a database, uh, um, you're allowed to do. With PG dump, there are a couple couple locks that it takes, but you're still allowed to uh, write, uh, read and write as much as you like. Um, the MVCC snapshot uh, cap capabilities in the database that guarantees that when, once it starts, uh, PG dump by the runs in a transaction so that everything that it gets is guaranteed to be that, that point in time snapshot. So, uh, yeah, it, it, you're, it, even as it's, as it's uh, reading that table, you're able to make changes to it. Postgres knows, okay, this row is, 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 is visible to this snapshot, this row isn't, so I'll just ignore that. So. It's, it's pretty, pretty nifty stuff. Um, it, but like I said, the, the performance is a little bit harder to optimize just because it starts at the beginning of a potentially multi-terabyte table and pretty soon to the end. Uh, it, you know, like a, the base backup example, you can do an rsync if your table is a change and you may only have a couple megabytes of changes. Uh, similarly, the restores are slow. Uh, if you're restoring a base backup, you're basically taking that already built structure and just drop it in place. Um, when you do a restore from a, from a PG dump output, all the data gets put in there, and then it has to rebuild the indexes. It has to do scans across the table to validate any constraints, uh, any foreign keys, anything like that. So uh, it, it can definitely take a little while longer compared to just grabbing all those files that are already, that it knows are already good and just putting them right there. Um, there's a couple things we can do to work around that though. PG dump uh, uh, doesn't necessarily always export uh, uh, as just text files. There's a custom format and a kind of a, a, a sister command to that called the directory format, uh, which is basically a pseudo binary-ish. It's basically the, the uh, output of, uh, of parts of those uh, commands, um, I mean parts of those uh, that dump into uh, individual files. And what that allows you to do is, especially with the directory format, you can do parallel, uh, parallel PD dumps, uh, multiple uh, jobs running against that same database. And the magic is like, using the same uh, uh, database snapshot. So it's still internally consistent, uh, even though you have multiple connections to that same database 
reading multiple tables and exporting the database at once. So, very am I to <laughs> um, So yeah, it, it's it can it can if you have a lot a lot of tables that are really big, that's one way to uh, um, uh, speed them up. And uh, the, it also allows for parallel restores. Uh, uses a command. This this uh, custom format and uh, also the directory format uses. Like I said, it doesn't write the, the uh, uh, SQL directly, but there's a command pt restore that can then read those, and itself is what generates those uh, SQL statements. And even if you don't, uh, even if you don't need that parallel uh, uh, features, uh, the pt restorers might you're using this custom format might be the way to go. If you've ever found yourself with the output of PG dump in a format that's uh, might not be to your liking, like there's a way to generate a, a cleanup command so it'll try to drop any tables that it wants to recreate itself. Uh, there's the ability to, you can inject um, the create database statement itself into that. Um, but if you do that with PG dump directly, that output is fixed. If you then, if you instead use this custom format, it basically it's basically a tar uh, tarball that has a, a special uh, table of contents. So then you could give that to PG Restore and ask it for um, you can ask it for that uh, create database statement if you need it. You can ask it for that, that drop table statements if you need them. You can ask it for the individual tables even if your PG jump output includes everything. It had it. Like I said, it has that table of contents, so it knows exactly where in that big tar file the, uh, uh, the data you want is located. So it can go there, uh, export that, you know, the insert or the copy statement that, that uh, builds your table, and uh, um, uh, is able to pull that specific table out of that dump. Uh, you, can, you can do the data only, you can do the schema only, all kinds of uh, uh, um, flexibility for that that you weren't, no, normally wouldn't get if you just had a fixed uh, So, yeah, that was quick. <laughs> so yeah, we have uh, two new rep uh, for replication stuff tomorrow. We talked about the uh, physical backup, which is your base backup plus uh, as many transaction logs as you have. And we talked about the different forms of uh, uh, logical backups, including PG dump and PG dump all. So, any questions? Also known as, what did I forget to put in this presentation? Have you ever had to edit a PG dump, like done the pure SQL text output? Have you ever had to like edit it so you can backport it or yes, actually, all sorts of weird goofy stuff? Totally forgot. That is one of the extra uh, additional benefits of the PG dump output mm -hmm. where it's all text. I have actually fed it through said before and had it change some value or I think maybe even some of the table names uh, on the fly as it's being fed into Postgres and done the restore. So yeah, that's, that's definitely a that's a benefit of using PG dump or uh, PG restore and just uh, modifying something on the fly as you restore something. Increase salary in an HR database. Kind of Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Put a couple more zeros behind. Yeah. Yeah. The important yeah, part yeah. of this where. And <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the, oh, the decimal point fell off. And, and yeah, oh, that's a very specific. I found it. I put it back. <laughs> it's very specific, yeah, it's it's in there somewhere. <laughs> You also mentioned uh, PG dump being compressible. So, yes. how much storage does that say versus base backup and transaction log? Depends on, well, it really just depends on how much transaction logs you have for one, just based on how much traffic you have. If you have a, a database that receives, you know, a blog isn't going to get much uh, write activity. But if you have, a, 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 you know, if you're running it for a bank that has transactions happening all day long, your transaction log. Uh, archive may be huge, so it really just depends on how much activity you get. Um, the base backups, eh, they're, they're, it's, they're not that compressible, but again, because you have, uh, um, in addition to the data you have in there, which may already be in some sort of pseudo compressed format, because Postgres, if, if you have really big columns, it'll only do its own internal compression. But, you know, if, if you have something like, if you, then export that to back to text and then put it through XZ or something like that, your compression is going to be a lot better. Uh, the base backup is going to have things like the index files and, and uh, the B tree or gist or whatever that format is might not be as compressible as 
mean, the, the, the PD dump output is, isn't going to contain any index data at all, certainly. So all that is avoided by just uh, getting mm -hmm. that uh, dump output. So it's so it's just trade-offs if, um, depending on how much, how, if space is more valuable to you or if the restore time is more valuable to you. Um, personally, I like doing both. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask, is it a one or the other, or do you mm -hmm. do a combination sometimes? Certainly do a, a combination sometimes, mm -hmm. especially where um, especially where it's important to have that, that point in time recovery. A couple of our clients, we have uh, do that both. Um, yeah. uh, we have a daily PG dumps, of, you know, it runs for an hour, just to yeah. uh, get all the data out and compress it. But we also keep the, uh, we do it, you know, I think, maybe weekly base backup and have transaction logs for as long as we need. Mm -hmm. and of course, that's also a trade-off, is how often do you do your base backups? If you've got a huge, a huge database, but you know, like our, our, our uh, RT database, our ticketing system, it's a big database, but we don't have a whole lot of activity in there. So we could theoretically do um, a base backup once a week, you know, on Sunday when there's not much happening, uh, let the transaction logs accumulate, and there's not much of those through the course of the week. And if we ever needed to do a restore, we just drop that in place and replay a, a few megabytes of transaction logs. Mm -hmm. A lot faster than running, because that, that database stores, uh, RT stores every file it receives, and it's a ticketing system, so it stores every file that's attached to a ticket in the database itself. <laughs> so, blobs. yeah, it's blobs. It, yeah, so the PG dump is it's huge. So I mean, it, it takes a long time for that to run. So just it, yeah. that's a big benefit, just being able to copy those files and then keep a couple mega things. Our stuff, uh, people use uh, Redmine and all kinds of other stuff anymore. So there's not much activity on that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh yeah, trade-offs. I don't mind ending a little early. Any other questions? Yeah. Sweet, excellent. Okay. Uh, I've got a relatively quick one, I guess, yeah. for you. Um, I'm not sure we're kind of coming from MySQL into uh, Postgres a little bit. You've and, seen uh, the light. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is so much better. But uh, <laughs> we're, uh, as far as the, the backup story, we're used to uh, Percona's uh, extra backup, which is. Mm -hmm. the, which was a wonderful oh, yeah, it's, it's good compared start. to MySQL dump and some yeah. more uh, onerous deals. But I was curious if you had any personal experience uh, of having used extra backup, how it compares to some of the tools you mentioned, like Barman and Wally and stuff, if there's one that's fairly, fairly comparable, or is it more of an apple oranges comparison it because of kind the wild differences between the two? Yeah, systems. it kind of is. Um, Yeah, it kind of is. I'm not quite sure what would be the best copper uh, a comparison for that, but um, uh, like it did like compression over the network, mm -hmm. fully encrypted online backups, uh, relatively uh, small size with XE, and then a lot of the uh, the bullet points that you had there on that slide were checkboxes there. But I was mm -hmm. curious if any uh, one or two of the ones on the left hand side have most of the features on the right. I guess would be. I mean, I'll do some input research, but yeah. just kind of based on your experience. My, my favorite, I think, is PG Backrest. <coughs> like I said, I used PG Hardware recently. I had uh, That one I had a few uh, uh, hurdles with uh, the encryption. Encryption never really seemed to work. I kind of like it's uh, PG Hardware did its own scheduling internally, which I kind of like. They didn't have to set up s uh, specific uh, uh, cron jobs for the, the daily uh, 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 PG, uh, the daily base backup. Didn't have to set up anything special in Postgres for the, the wall archival. Uh, it, it kind of it took care of all that itself. So it was kind of kind of nice. It was a little a little bit more hands off. Uh, but PG Backrest itself is pretty uh, pretty full featured. Um, uh, we that for the system that I, that I did that one on, uh, it, it's all running on Amazon. So it was being able to push all everything it had to S3 was pretty important. So that cloud storage integration. Uh, that one does 
I think PGP based encryption, something like that. Uh, and I see before it gets to S3, we don't rely on S3s that uh, are built in encryption. The storage efficiency on that one is actually really interesting. PG backrest, uh, it, it kind of, I hadn't thought about that in a while, but for a long time, but it kind of goes back to that old concept of uh, the, the full backup and incremental backups. Um, Postgres stores its tables as uh, one gigabyte chunks. So if you've got a table bigger than that, it splits it into that, into, a, into individual files. So PG backrest is smart enough to know that if a file hasn't we, the, the client that I, that I was doing this for has, has a really big, it, kind of the same thing, a, a blob table uh, and that was just basically appended to. So being able to do uh, daily incremental backups, uh, that those one gigabyte chunks are left in place and referred to by future backups. So we're not making multiple, uh, storing this multiple copies of the same data. actually also pretty smart about retention. Um, uh, most of them are pretty smart about this, but um, like I said, you, you've got this long string of transaction logs that are associated with potentially multiple base backups. So you've got, you, you're doing a base backup daily, you've got, you want to start, I mean, you don't want to store this forever. So, you know, you store maybe a week or so's worth. Um, uh, so that last, you know, your eighth one you throw away, but that's associated with some number of transaction logs. At some point, you want to you want to keep those transaction logs because that that seventh base backup is, is is still needs those. But some no, some number of transaction logs before that, you, you just want to throw away because they're no longer useful. So it, most of these will do that computation for you and know exactly where where to do it. Uh, but certainly, uh, PG backrest. And I guess a, a little bit of a follow-up since you mentioned uh, uh, at least for that project you were using uh, AWS there. Were you using RDS or your own uh, Postgres instances on, on top of EC2? We were doing our, for that one we are doing our own Postgres instances primarily because we, we were replicating it off to uh, uh, other systems because this, this for this client we did a uh, multi-cloud which it's kind of a pain in the, in the took us, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's nice not having, you know, if, if it works, AWS, it's nice, otherwise it's yeah, just a firestorm. If, yeah, if AWS goes kablooey, then I'll be, yeah, no more worries. We, we'll just fail over to DigitalOcean. We're good. <laughs> um, yeah, RDS uh, does its own internal replication, but you can't get any of that stuff out. You're kind of locked in with that. You're, you're, you're locked in. You can PG dump out of it, but the physical files mm -hmm. they, for the base backup for, for any of that replication stream, it mm -hmm. does not let you do any of that. So we had to do it ourselves for mm -hmm. this, which for us, we're fine with that. Uh, what would be the pros and cons of doing like PG dump or doing the base backup and the transaction log versus just dumping your whole VM besides space? Besides space, um, as long as as long as those snapshots of the VM are atomic, right, it, it's as long as it's a, it's guaranteed to be a point in time of that that file system, then you're safe. But if, if there's any uh, uh, any drift of, uh, of of that copy, then you might be run into a little bit of trouble. It's, it's the same thing as doing the file copy. There might still be things in flight that. Um, that uh, uh, either haven't been written to disk by the time it gets there, and then it gets to the point of transaction logs, and the transaction logs thinks it's already been written to disk. So that that variation of where Postgres is writing things and where that copy happens is where the danger of doing the file copy is. Um, but as long as as long as those snapshots are atomic, as long as uh, it, it guarantees that's a that's a point in time, then when you do the restore of the, and at that point it's just kind of like. Uh, um, it's kind of like you've had a power loss. So the, all that Postgres recovery uh, code comes into play and, that, and uses those transaction logs to bring it back up to consistency. So yeah, if, if you can do that, it's, it's certainly uh, certainly worth doing. It's just a little bit, uh, as, long as, as long as it's at that, that specific point in time, it says there's no risk to it.
three. Actually, it brings us pretty much right up to uh, where I should stop. So, if there's no other questions, then have a good day. <laughs>